Okay, Jan Janice Lee, who's connecting with us from Hong Kong, is managing director of the PCCW Media Group. PCCW, uh, if you don't know, is the stands for Pacific Cyber uh, Works, and uh, it's a company that bought the Hong Kong telephone company. So it started out owning the landline company, and has since diversified into all kinds of media services. And Janice is running, and has been running for the last 12 or 13 years, if I'm not mistaken, the, the media business for that group. The group is owned by, a large shareholder is Richard Lee, who is the son of Lee ka -shing. And Lee ka -shing is probably the best known uh, business tycoon in Hong Kong. And over the last 12 or 13 years, starting in a small Hong Kong market, because the Hong Kong market, by, by definition, is a small market, but a very vibrant and dynamic and very competitive market. They've developed products that they've then been able to sell across other parts of uh, Asia. And as the bio describes, they are not only in you know, the cable TV services or landline services or the internet services and, and so on, they're also in, in OTT services, and they are uh, expanding into products like, you know, uh, what they call uh, Move, which is a music. If you're uh, a participant, press uh, pound or hash now. If you're the moderator. The big opportunity they're looking for now is possibly getting into China. So unlike some of the other companies we've talked about that are already engaged in China and are wondering how to adapt to China, uh, the PCCW Media Group is not heavily engaged in China, but is looking to get more engaged in, in China. Is Janice there? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. Uh, hi, Janice. Good. Uh, again, hi. I, I don't know if you could hear me introduce you. I've given them a very quick introduction. But I want to thank you first for making time for us at a crazy time of the day for you. Thank you so much. Oh, not at all. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I wish I could see everybody on screen here. Um, unfortunately, I cannot. So hopefully you can still um, see the, the slides I was going to share. And also, I hope the audio quality is good enough for um, you over there. Yes, the audio is good. We can see the slides. And I hope maybe we'll be able, you'll be able to see us too, if you guys can, if you can make that connection. Can she see us? Right. I, no. Yeah, well, I see. OK, now I do. Yes, okay. it's been uh, zoomed in. So I do see the round tables. Again, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Take it away, Janice. Cool. OK, so well, first of all, a little bit of introduction um, about myself, but also about what I'm going to share today. A bit of context about PCW Media. I know Ravi's probably given a little bit of introduction um, before I got connected. Um, about the challenges that we face as an industry, and I don't think that is unique um, to just us sitting here in Hong Kong or out here in Asia. Um, you are seeing very similar changes, probably even more so ahead of us um, years ago already, um, and how we as an organization in the media business try to stay relevant, find growth. Um, and then lastly, um, a section about mainland China. Like Ravi said, um, there, because media is such a highly regulated um, a sector in mainland China, um, we go into it very carefully. Um, there are certain things that we are able to you know, uh, extract as opportunity and certain things that we are absolutely cautious about and invest in China in a very measured way and uh, keen to share with you uh, what we've learned over the years um, and love to uh, look forward to our Q&A session after the short uh, presentation. So I think I have about uh, 40 minutes, and I would try to spend about 20 minutes um, on our story, and then leave about 20 minutes for um, any questions or, um, that you may have. So who are, who are we? We are a media business that has a um, subscription platform. Um, it used to be mainly just pay TV, but even domestically, um, it's now expanded into an OTT streaming service, multiple device. Uh, Hong Kong is a relatively small market, so there are only about 2.4 million households in Hong Kong, and you can see that we have already have 55% uh, market penetration, and therefore, you know, part of the challenge that is the market size. 
But in in order to find growth, we've been developing and expanding our digital media portfolio, including um, a pan-regional OTT video streaming service now uh, present in 18 markets. And we have a, a, a digital music streaming service in Hong Kong as well as Vietnam. Now, in this all, we started as more um, of a distribution platform over the years. That is how we became the market leader for the pay TV service. But however, we do see um, in, an, in the future, a lot of the value is going to be in the content creation because owning the content um, that you can monetize and create content assets is going to be an important part of how we continue to create value um, uh, for our stakeholders. Uh, very easy to see what Now TV essentially is. I think all of these are very uh, familiar to you because they are the usual suspects that you see in the US and Europe. Um, what is popular globally is also popular here in Hong Kong, including Game of Thrones, including golf, tennis, um, billions, and, and other uh, children's programs as well. The Now TV service has about 170 channels, but more and more, uh, the linear channels is not the primary way of how viewers watch TV anymore. It is still important for live sports, but however, a lot of the content is delivered on an on-demand basis. Uh, and, and that is really um, what is the, the core change in our service offering to that uh, subscription uh, uh, pay TV crowd. Now, recognizing that Hong Kong is a small market and that we already have about 55% market share, um, in the last um, actually five to seven years, we have started developing a Hong Kong-based OTT streaming service, um, uh, now E, um, E standing for Entertainment Everywhere for Everybody. Um, so it's available on any device. But we've also learned new things, right? It, is, it isn't just about putting the same content on a different uh, platform or different screen. Whereas on a uh, pay TV service, uh, at least in our market, people used to, and people still do, sign on to 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, even 36 months contracts. So the subscription business was very stable in terms of recurring revenue. However, as we move to a more OTT um, and internet streaming service, consumer expectations are very different. They expect maximum flexibility. They want to be in control, including they actually don't want to be locked into a contract. They look at monthly plan, even day pass for sports we sell and season pass. The, ter the, the situation with long-term contract is no longer um, the case, right? So we have got to adjust right, how we acquire customers smartly because if you know you're going to have the customer for 24 months, you can spend certain costs on that. If you know that you're selling day pass or monthly pass, you've got to look at what we now is doing performance marketing um, much more critically. And um, I will share uh, a little bit about um, what we're doing as we transform from, uh, from a more traditional pay TV business to this, this uh, much more digital business. It also includes, you know, it is not the full bundle of content. You don't stuff everybody with a big bundle of content that people don't want. It is much more vertical. People get to choose whether they, they want sports, whether they want entertainment, and how they want to pay for it. Um, of course, first run movies are still, uh, and TV series are still very important. We also allow for um, TVOT, which is transactional VOD services as part of the offering. So what have been our challenges, right? Up till now, we have done well. In fact, um, while Now TV is a market leader, we actually, we were the underdog, right? That, that business has been around for about 15 years. But when we came in 15 years ago, um, we were not the incumbent. The incumbent cable company was a traditional uh, business, which now um, is only 30% of the market. And us being not the second, not the third, but the fourth to enter the market. And because we were based on the newer technology, uh, IPTV technology, we were able to um, um, have a much better offering technologically, visually, and, and, and as well as in terms of how we price and package our service. But fast forward 15 years on and how we've really disrupted the market to become a market leader, um, we are also getting challenged. Um, first of all, our competition is now borderless, right? Um, our competition is coming from international markets, global players, uh, and also, in some ways, piracy. That's always going to be in the background, unfortunately, in the media business. We also saw uh, what I like to call uh, general competition, general disruption versus 
temporary disruption. So we've had situations where, you know, the genuine uh, disruptions of general uh, competition, I think it's healthy, right? Health, healthy in the sense that it pushes us to reinvent ourselves. It pushes us to uh, not be complacent and continue to innovate. The temporary disruption or unnecessary disruption is we've had actually um, a uh, seen a mainline company come into a small market like Hong Kong, double the price uh, in terms of bidding for sports rights on everything, um, and basically uh, took away some rights from us, right, for let's say a year. But because they didn't really have a go-to-market strategy, they literally went into bankruptcy within the year. Now, but because they were there for the year, uh, we were able to hold on to our subscriber base because they didn't really have a go-to-market strategy. But in defending the market, we spent some cost. We were um, also trying to renew our contracts with the customers early. And that did uh, uh, cost us a little bit of our pool, right? But that sort of disruption really doesn't help us to improve ourselves or in improve our offering um, to the market. But um, a year on, that is now gone. What is remaining unchanged is the um, a new competition coming in um, from new platforms. That does not require a pay TV license. What is going to be an ongoing challenge is also the future of content supply. Um, whether it is the Netflixes um, of the world who are uh, investing into original shows in the US. Now, there are only so many shows getting made. Right? If they are taking first pick of it, it might not make it into one of our partners, whether it is the HBOs or whether, you know, it, it, and uh, uh, Fox and the like. The other one is with Disney and, and with some mergers that you've seen, um, you know, whether it's Disney acquiring Fox um, or, you know, other deals like the AT&T deal. Um, the question is still out there, right? As they develop their direct-to-consumer offering globally, and unclear yet what um, exactly they're, how they're going to execute um, in each of the region, um, but they obviously do seem like have a very uh, a substantial plan behind that. Obviously, uh, first of all, to to regain right the, the market share in the domestic streaming market and also in Europe, but I'm sure Asia is going to be a big part of it. Now, that future content supply may change because everything now, what we call the pay one window, which is the earliest window after theatrical, flows to players like ourselves. In the future, will it be the same way? We don't know yet. And I already mentioned market size right, as one of the um, external challenges. As we grow our business, there are also internal challenges that we have to tackle organizationally. Um, one of it is actually... Um, a much more complex business. When I first met Ravi, we had only barely gotten started um, with Now TV, and we were super focused, just you know, on the very strong uh, growth path in growing that business. Again, 15 years later, we now have three businesses: we have a pay business, free TV business, and an OTT streaming business. These three are in very different development stage. The first one being um, the, the, the largest um, of the three at about 380 million in terms of turnover, uh, about uh, 60 million um, in terms of um, profitability. The other two have only been started in the last two to three years, so it is still in development phase. So as we um, uh, grow, and we needed the new growth business, Right, because we have to look towards the future. How do we continue to motivate and incentivize the team um, across the board to deliver um, different things, right? Uh, different KPIs, that is what we require, um, profitability versus growth. Second is um, in finding growth, we are an organization that definitely favored speed to market. And I will come to that. So that was absolutely the right strategy uh, in how we did that. But it does mean, um, that having gained grounds very quickly in 18 markets outside of Hong Kong, um, we now have to look at, you know, how do we balance, right, speed versus effectiveness, e efficiency, I should say. And with three lines of business, uh, I think there's always a struggle with the three lines of business. Uh, are we driving? Are we trying to maximize each line of business, right? And in doing so, are we not um, getting enough synergy um, are we not optimizing our cost enough, right? Are we running different, you know, technical platforms to support our three services? And lastly, organizationally, um, as we move towards the new growth businesses, um, especially outside of our territory, um, being able to recruit talent outside of our home market, uh, new skill set that is much more of a growth mindset, 
um, in this new uh, landscape of competition is very, very important. The classic S-curve actually really applied um, in our case because now TV, while you know last year we were still able to grow both top line and bottom line, it is nonetheless not a high growth business. But we have, uh, three years ago, started developing new services, and that is so crucial to, to sort of un know uh, when you're going to be reaching sort of some sort of maturity of one business, and don't be afraid to jump onto the next S-curve and already start building your next business. And we absolutely um, find it is our situation. The next thing that I'm sure we will find is, is that these S-curves will become shorter and shorter. Um, we will need to continue to find um, and develop, whether it's ancillary services, whether it's expanding our services, but to find the new, new engine for growth. And, and again, not being complacent that what we develop today um, is going to be the business model um, for the next 10 years. And I think we've seen that with the internet, right, uh, with different services um, that was popular years ago, right, um, that are less popular now. And even looking at Facebook, while it, it is do, still you know, hugely popular and successful, um, I have a teenage daughter and certainly her usage of Facebook is very low. Um, and looking forward to the next generation, you know, what are they using, right? Of course, it, it's Snapchat, the Instagrams of the likes, um, but obviously, these companies also recognize that and have acquired um, various different services that appeals to sort of the next generation of segments. Um, so we focus on finding um, um, a strategy that would put us on a continuous uh, growth curve uh, to tackle this next set of challenges. And in doing so, I think, you know, ideally we're firing on all four cylinders and taking a balance in doing it first, doing it efficiently, doing it right, and doing it together. But we also found that in our journey, it was important to be able to communicate internally. Um, you know, when we were in the growth and innovation phase to really focus on doing it first, um, understanding we still need to have control, um, whether that's a finance function, compliance function, but to be able to, as an organization, um, balance, but uh, lean probably in one more than the other. And now we're sort of in the second phase where we have to do everything much more efficiently in order to drive our growth, but also uh, to uh, um, increase the, um, the capital efficiency of everything that we do. So now VIEW is in um, 18 markets um, with 30 million users, um, 100 million um, social media reach. And our proposition is very Asian-centric, including Korean, Chinese, um, and other uh, Asian content. We also produce locally now um, outside of Hong Kong in English, uh, Malay Bahasa, Indonesia Bahasa, and various um, different languages. Um, and I mentioned we are in the second phase where we're trying to gain efficiency. So in doing so, how we serve our customers, we need to reduce cost. And so a lot of the call center functions are now re being replaced by chatbots. Um, most of the uh, routine inquiries can be taken off, uh, taken care of um, by chatbots, and that has substantially reduced cost, but also improved uh, customer satisfaction because most people actually do not want to talk with somebody on the phone these days. They prefer to be able to reach someone online, but rather immediately. Uh, we are investing into new technologies like AR, augmented reality for sports viewing. I had a video here, but unfortunately, we tried the video quality and it's not good enough uh, to show you um, on, um, on this uh, screen here through the connection. But this projects a 3D uh, match onto a tabletop. And this is something that our higher value customers would pay extra for. And so we still, apart from delivering our content over the top, which is all about mobility, we also value um, uh, being able to increase um, the visual quality and the attractiveness of the sports a lot. Um, in China, um, there is also development on um, uh, AI anchors that can mimic very accurately the intonation um, um, as well as the uh, news broadcasters roll quite effectively, and that is going to help us um, in uh, running 24-hour news channels that we do. 
Other things that we are doing uh, that optimize efficiency, including you know, battling illegal sites by um, uh, having robots to uh, crawl the internet and improve on takedown, that will improve, that has actually improved um, our traffic by about 30%. Uh, we also use machine learning um, uh, and video recognition that can ingest all of the videos and, um, and tag the videos for us. So we've had a toothpaste brand in the Philippines who sponsored a series of kiss scenes. And without going into all of the uh, archive, we were able to ingest content and pull out all of the scenes for the client. And um, lastly, in using lookalike model um, in doing better and more accurate predictive lifetime value um, of subscribers we acquire online. In the interest of time, I'm going to flick through the next few um, and um, get to the China uh, part, which I know there is a lot of interest about, especially um, uh, during um, this uh, phase of the trade war. But just to wrap up the first part, um, what we've seen is consumer behavior has changed. It is not a bubble. Our business has certainly been impacted, but we also found opportunities to evolve and grow. Uh, but there's always the analog dollars in the digital sense, right? We have to do so much more um, in this digital world. Um, and so being able to do things uh, efficiently, cost effectively is so important because the uh, ARPU, the, the revenue you get, um, uh, from a particular customer may not be as high as uh, the traditional pay TV service. And lastly, to definitely um, take advantage of technology to improve our efficiency and gain speed to market. Very quickly then um, to China as a media company. Well, first of all, China does offer um, a lot of opportunities um, despite this media sector being a highly uh, regulated sector. If we look at the movie, so this uh, slides on movies, the movie box office in mainland China is about 8.8 .8 billion. Um, I believe US is about 11 billion. Uh, so um, China is basically the second, I believe, uh, largest movie market um, outside of the US. Uh, and out of the 8.8 .8 billion, about 60 to 62% are domestic mainland China films. But it does mean that there's still about 40% that is foreign films received. And that is why um, this market has always still been important uh, to, in delivering the international market for the Hollywood studios. Uh, China has uh, reached over 60,000 screens nationwide, and they're adding over 9,000 screens, right, just in one year in 2017 alone. U.S. has 40,000 screens, right? So in terms of number of screens, that has already surpassed um, the U.S. Of course, receipts per theater, per screen, um, and, and per ticket is much lower than the U.S., but it does show the potential of growth if you look at the trajectory of the screen built um, in mainland China. But there is, right, um, a quota on foreign film and very strict censorship. So while there is still, you know, 40%, close to 40% of the uh, movie uh, box office coming from international foreign films, uh, largely Hollywood films, uh, the quota is 34 titles a year. Just a snapshot, um, this does not include the Avengers and games yet, but if you look at it, right, these are the top grossing movies um, in uh, mainland China. So take the top example, Avengers Infinity War, um, this is about 340 million U.S. dollars. If I remember correctly, Avengers um, Infinity War in the U.S. did about over 600 million. So this is almost China delivering half of the U.S. domestic uh, box uh, office span. I think the last time I looked at Endgames, I think the U.S. box office was about 800, 900 million. I think China, there was a report that says it was 600. It might be a little... Um, exaggerated, I don't know yet, but it was that sort of number that's being mentioned. So it is still right, um, an important market um, in, um, for especially big films, because a big films, international market is always almost 60% at least right, of the total um, 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 box office uh, receipts of a particular film. So this basically just shows the growth. You can see um, the box office overall in reaching 8.8%. .8 um, uh, billion. It's grown at 9%. It's a bit slower than the last couple of years, but it's still about 9% growth. 
So what are the, um, on the TV side, right, that's much, that's sort of more our, our, our business. Um, what have we been seeing? Well, it is because TV is seen as even a much more pervasive uh, medium because it is in the home in every household. So in some ways, the, um, there are more restrictions, there are more cens censorship. Foreign cast, crew, and producers um, in each of the category, you can only have one um, um, foreign uh, uh, personnel right, in each of these categories. Um, rest needs to be local. Um, there has been some relaxation for um, uh, us from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from Macau, where the movies and TV series quota is not so limited. Uh, but generally, uh, producers and directors cannot both be foreign. Um, the male and female lead cannot both be foreign. And of course, you know, there are restrictions on uh, current affairs and news programs. So these are basically, the, if you go into this market, you have to play by these rules. And, and, um, but because the market is quite large, uh, you are still able to, to make it work. Um, what is a bit harder is some of the things that I will talk about, which is the changing policy that's been happening, happening much more rapidly um, in the last um, 12 to 18 months. This includes, and it's, it, it, the, the change in media policy isn't always uh, about targeting uh, foreign companies. Recently, uh, about six, six months ago, um, there was a big change in, in, in regulation where for a particular movie or series production, 40, um, there's a 40% cap on total talent fee because the market was read as very overheated, where the only people making money was the cast and the talent. Um, they were literally could be 50, 60, 70% of the total production cost. And um, the staff just decided that they're going to reduce it, and so they put a cap on it, right? In some ways, it may make the movie production industry healthier because more money is actually going on screen in the production itself versus just the talent. Um, but it was quite a, a overnight change in this cap. Second is in total talent fee, it cannot exceed um, uh, the sorry the main cast talent fee cannot exceed. 70% of the total talent fee, which is along similar lines um, of what we uh, talked um, about just now. Um, there was tightening control of uh, tax uh, reporting because there was a lot of issues about people misreporting. So a lot of this was aimed at fixing the domestic system. But in doing so, if there were companies that were caught where um, they were in the midst of production, and they have made certain commitment and they have made certain projections, but in the middle of this, it all changed. It does affect the economics, but also the one thing that you have to be prepared to do as you go into mainland China is um, change is a constant. You expect that um, what was happening, you have to kind of factor this risk in. For production, it's particularly hard because the cycle is nine months, a year in planning, development, and the actual production itself, um, there were many cases where uh, uh, films and movies were shot, um, but the uh, policy has changed, and um, uh, shows weren't able to make it on air. Um, other things include broadcasters uh, cannot import in excess of 30% of programming in each category um, um, from um, outside of mainland China similarly applies um, to the online streamers. Having said that, um, mainland China still produces over uh, 13,000 episodes uh, a year that's approved. Of course, that's only 30% of the project that's put through staff for approval. Um, lastly, a couple of examples, which is China's uh, content and its role in the global market. We have started to see uh, mainland productions um, gaining traction outside of mainland China in overseas market, particularly um, in Southeast Asia. So last year, there was a very successful show called Yanzi Palace. Um, BBC says it's one of the most Googled show um, on earth. Uh, but, but this uh, success was really quite phenomenal. However, after this show was aired, um, there was also uh, a change in policy because this show uh, was one 
one of the the most popular ones. But at the same period of time, there started to be this genre that's about、um, palace intrigue and、uh, palace sort of、um, competition、uh, between the different.、Uh, uh, Characters in that that was seen as quite negative, and also it promoted sort of a sense of、uh, lavishness in in、um, the outlook of the film, as well as in the production and how it appears to consumers. Since then, the sort of palace intrigue type of、uh, uh, films and, and particularly TV series、um, is、uh, no longer allowed. Uh, so again, while you think you can catch on the wave of something that has been very successful, and for people who really were banking on producing the next Yancey Palace,、uh, they would have gotten caught in the process.、Uh, we have actually also acquired、uh, mainland contacts、uh, for the overseas market, and this is one of one of them.、Um, interestingly, um, uh, this is.、Uh, Big cast.、Um, it is not a palace intrigue. It is a historical drama.、Uh, however,、uh, we just caught news that even this one's been delayed. So we're facing this every day.、Um, you know, we structure our deals very carefully now, knowing that、uh, content will get censored even after, and the, there might be a delay in the airing window. So we can't bank on it 100%. What we have been able to do is. For our Hong Kong production, because、uh, there is no、uh, or less restriction on quota, no quota、um, in a lot of respect,、um, to for us to take content into mainland China, especially onto the streaming platforms, we have、um, been able to distribute our content on the three major streaming platforms, including Tencent Video, ITE, and also Youku. We have been able to produce for them、um, as a base、um, out of Hong Kong. And the next thing that we're looking at is、um, live performances, which are also opportunities for us as a Hong Kong company. So I know that's really a lot of information, and I, you know, have probably gone too quickly. But I do want to leave.、Um, I think now we have about ten minutes、um, for a bit of Q and A. So I'll open the floor up to that. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Over there, please. Hi, Janice. Can you share a little bit about being a Hong Kong company penetrating into China? Yes. So,、um, so Ravi knows our story quite well, and that's why he he knows we we are not in mainland a big way for two reasons.、Right? One, our business、um, in in. As a media company,、uh, we are a platform. So we have a streaming service, much like a Netflix, much like the Tencent Video and ITE.、Um, apart from the censorship and restrictions、uh, and policies, already there are natural barriers because the mainland market, in terms of、uh, streamers, there are these three who have been actually investing and burning a lot of cash in the market to get to where they are. So for us, the hurdle is very high as a Hong Kong company to go into it naturally. Um, and be able to catch up with that.、Uh, so we see it much more as a, a base for us to、uh, bring content, because given the production cost and the level of quality that's being invested into in mainland, we do see the opportunity to take that content outside of China. And secondly, is for whatever that we produce in Hong Kong, it does represent for us an export market where we can sell into、uh, um, these various platforms. So, so、uh, Janet, as you look to the future, do you see yourself growing、uh, faster in the、uh, the 18 countries that you're already operating in, or, given the size of the Chinese、uh, market, is that is it conceivable that you could be doing more business in China than you're doing in all of the other countries put together? I I think our role would be very different inside China versus our strategy outside. Our strategy outside. Is we are、uh, the, one of the largest streaming platform in Southeast Asia. We produce content locally in those markets. We do both, right? In mainland China, I don't see ourselves as being one of the streamers because already there's a very robust market there. But I do see the opportunity as、um, from a content uh, production and uh, co content uh, exploitation point of view. 
Will that business become larger than um, our um, overseas business? I think probably not in the short term because um, there's quite a lot of competition, but definitely in the long term, uh, hopefully as the market uh, opens up a bit more. And we've seen, particularly for Hong Kong companies, there's been a, re a relaxation on some of the um, uh, restrictions that we may be able to develop a much more robust business there for ourselves. Just a second, Janice. Janice, nice to see you again. Actually, I'm here with uh, Jen and myself. This is Evan Berry. We met you on our China trip. So uh, thanks again 10 years ago for this uh, presentation. Um, what, are you, what is your business doing in terms of different demographics? So one being children and also from a learning perspective. A really, really great question. Just this year, um, we, in fact, just in April, literally last month, um, we launched um, a new strategy for children, which is a much more STEM-centric um, learning pack. Because just being able to provide um, the blockbusters movies and the first-run TV series is not enough, especially for the pay TV business. Um, we look at what people are still willing to pay for, and parents are very willing to pay, and, and not to um, uh, sort of generalize here, but in, uh, for Hong Kong Asian parents, um, definitely, right? They have a lot of appetite, and they're spending a lot of money outside of class, uh, classrooms for STEM learning, um, tutorials for robotics classes. So we've launched, launched a STEM learning pack, but we've also taken a strategy that's both online and offline. So just in servicing that kids segment with more educational content, streaming video on all platform isn't enough. What we did was this STEM learning pack also includes um, uh, working with an educational toys uh, company who produces you know, science experiment toys, robotics toys, and with the subscription to the pack, we actually uh, would provide uh, every month um, a hands-on uh, kit for parents and, and, and the kids to um, do at home, right? So it extends our role beyond just being a linear broadcaster. That's fantastic. How is that um, added to your top or bottom line from a percentage standpoint? Right, because we, we literally launched that in April, so it's been um, just a month. Uh, so it's a little too early, but we did see a lot of traction um, in terms of subscribers. Uh, we also did a um, on-ground events that includes, you know, Spartan for kids, etc. And we saw the sort of l level of um, activeness that we haven't seen before from any segment of our base. Janice, if I could ask you a final question about uh, how you see the media business and the innovation and dynamism in this industry across all of the different countries in which you operate. And if you could benchmark that against the U.S., because I know you, you don't do business in the U.S., but you are uh, frequently in the U.S., you know what's happening in the U.S. Give us an idea of uh, which is the most dynamic, cutting-edge market in, in the media business. Mm. Actually, from a, a um, streaming uh, video point of view, it is actually mainland China. Because they have started, right, Tencent Video, ITE, and Yuku, they've been doing this for the last 10 years. Um, they, th yes, there is no international competition in those markets, but if you look at, because there's the scale of the market, so in terms of technology development, a few things that they've, they have really done well and optimized in the last 10 years. When they first launched, I remember um, all of them were complaining and had the biggest headache was CDN cost, right, content network delivery. Uh, delivery network cost, right? Bandwidth cost was huge, right? If you're serving streaming videos all the time, and the, the cost was so high that it takes away a lot of the uh, um, um, profitability, right? Um, and, and at that point, they weren't even profitable and still yet, but it does cost them a lot of money. So they've had to spend a lot of energy in optimizing the uh, video and coding um, technology, the CDN uh, delivery effectiveness. So they've got that because of the scale. Um, secondly, is the data that they've collected, because I mean, any one of these platforms, their they're daily you know, active users, we're talking about could be um, 
500 you know, million easily, right? So, so it, it's quite a lot of usage data that they have accumulated right over the years. Thirdly, is their ad tech technology as well, because in the beginning, I think you will hear, right, oh, do, will people pay for content in China? For the first probably eight years, nobody did. So it was a purely a, uh, advertising supported service. So they've really optimized, you know, where to put ads, what formats of ads that, um, sh and how ads should appear online. And then the last few, two years, they have now been moving people onto the membership base, which they call, what they call them. It, it's essentially a subscription base. So it's very cheap. It's less than like $3, um, uh, well, it's about $3, $4 US. Um, but one of the platform now has not like 90 million subscribers, right, paying that sort of fees and is, is, is growing. So um, because of the scale of the market, they, they, they are, you know, amongst um, at least Southeast Asia and the markets that we operate in, uh, mainland China do have a, uh, the a technology and the scale that, that um, has been developed. Well, <clears throat> Dennis, I think our time is, uh, is up. I know it's very late in the day for you. You may have uh, gathered from some of the questions that we have in the audience uh, a number of alumni from the executive MBA program who had the pleasure of hearing you and uh, meeting you in person when they were in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and I think we're all impressed by, we were always very impressed by our visits to uh, Now TV, and we are even more impressed by all of the things you've done since. And we wish you continued success, and I hope the next time we can see you here in person. Yes, absolutely, and thank you. Thanks thank, for the time. Today. Thank you, Janice.